Tonight, it's the first iteration of Culture Exchange, which is a new initiative by Louis Vuitton in the Miami Design District that features leading artists and puts them in dialogue with creative professionals here in Miami. Please join me in welcoming a local hero, Harmony Corinne. The present, you're working on a film. Yeah. It's based here in Miami. It's called, yeah. It's called The Beach Bum. Yeah. More or less. It could subject to change. Yeah, I don't, it's weird. I, the new, with the new stuff, I, I don't talk too much about it just because it might not happen if I say, because I haven't made the movie yet, so it's something I'm putting together. But it's kind of a, it's a funny, it'll be a funny movie. Originally, it took, well, some of it took place in Havana and, and some here, and I'm playing around with locations now. We'll see. But it looks like it's going to happen uh, towards the end of the year. And you're calling it a stoner comedy? Yeah, or my version of that. It's a kind of stoned out movie. It'll, it's very funny. It'll be, it'll be funny. So um, Florida is a bit of a it's, a... it's a big topic in American culture, ranging from crime fiction to crime TV to crime reality. <laughs> um, how did you become interested in this topic? And I just always... Yeah, I didn't grow up here... I grew up in Nashville. I always liked Florida and South Florida to me is always a weird place. And it's got a strange vibe to it. And uh, <laughs> I could never wrap my head around it really. And it's very, for me, it's also, it's very visually, it's very beautiful. And I like the psychogeography of the place, um, the way it, the way it kind of looks and feels, the the light and the, um, architecture and just mainly feels like a place the further down you go like it's more witness protection program like <laughs> I like that like everyone's trying to dis the idea of disappearing um, becoming something else I like what's like not on the, the main roads and what's in the back alleys and under the palm trees and there's a beauty to it and there's also a sinisterness to it there's a playfulness to it and there's a violence uh, something that is intriguing to me the, there's a lot of weirdness that comes from all the sun and, and the mixture of tourists and the Latin element and uh, the economics being so much wealth and, and so much poverty all pushed up together it's, it makes for an interesting place I also like that there's no winters so yeah, me too. It's cool, and, and then I've been, my wife and I have been coming here for a couple of years, and I, I would come sometimes to write scripts, and then every time I leave, we would leave, we would be like, oh, I want to go back, and so then we were just like, you know, fuck it, let's just move there, and because uh, <laughs> you can really be wherever you want to be, I mean, or I can be wherever I want to be. <laughs> I don't like have a, like a job. A, reg a regular job, so I feel like I could go anywhere. Like, I could do what I do in, like, you know, Bermuda or... But know. at the same time, you are such a master at finding amazing locations yeah. and amazing people. Yeah. And through shooting... And remind me of the town you shot Spring Breakers in, because it's not Panama City, but it's... It was um, St. Petersburg, St. Pete. Yeah. And between spending time there and spending time here, what are yeah. the kinds of, of places that you've been mixing in and uh, finding inspiration, not, to, not as a spoiler, but what, are there any places here in the city that have been particularly strange, inspiring, eerie, or resonant? Yeah, but I can't really say, because I don't want to blow it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to keep those things close. Um, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, what happened was, I'll tell you, when I was doing Spring Breakers was that when I was a kid in Nashville, all the, for spring break, all the kids would get in their cars and drive to Daytona Beach for spring break. And so in, when I had the idea to make that movie, I wanted to write it where spring breakers were. So I flew to Daytona Beach. But when I went, it was, it was a, a lesbian biker week. And it was just these big women on bikes. And... Uh, they were intimidating, and there was no spring break there. And, and so I had heard there hadn't been spring break there since the 80s, and then I went to, they told me, some woman told me it was in, uh, where was it, uh, Panama City. And I went, 
during spring break there, and I was staying in like a Holiday Inn, and the hotel was shaking. It was just like, and uh, there was puke everywhere, and it was pretty crazy. So I, I took off, went to St. Pete, wrote the script, and I just said, let's make it there. And uh, I know you don't want to talk about it so much, so I don't want to push you too much on it. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> well, what? <laughs> I, I don't want to push you too much on, on future projects, but yeah. the casting of Matthew McConaughey um, is a pretty interesting gesture. I mean, casting yeah. is also such an yeah. important and interesting um, part of your practice and yeah. your filmmaking. You've cast incredible artists, including your wife, in a really interesting yeah. role. Um, and so I wonder, maybe because casting lives in this space of a narrative that lives both in and outside of your films, and also in a realm of some kind of like fantasy, you could say, for this particular character, how did that, yeah. what was that fantasy production? I can't talk about it. It's too... <laughs> I just it hasn't happened yet, so I, I, I'll talk about it and something bad will happen, and then I'll, I'll be a douche. So. So let's change topics then. All right. <laughs> um, you're having your first um, retrospective in an art museum mm -hmm. at the Pompidou. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have a rich history and exchange with the art world. Mm -hmm. um, you work with Larry Gagosian, but also uh, had overlaps with people like Christopher Wool. In fact, I think I actually originally met you through Rita Ackerman. Mm -hmm. um, people like Martin Kippenberger. Mm -hmm. How has this engagement, this interaction with artists influenced what you do? Uh, or in particular, yeah. someone like Martin Kippenberger, who's such a nut. Yeah. Um, are there any particular personalities or potentials for being an artist that have inspired you? Yeah, all those people. I was a kid when I first met them, and I was, uh, that's kind of how I was introduced to a lot of contemporary art, contemporary artists. And this was in the early midnight, like I graduated high school in 92 and moved to New York. Um, that's when I met Larry Clark. And that's kind of when I started to uh, meet a lot of those artists that you talked about. So I, I up until that point, I didn't really have, a, uh, you know, I was, a, I was a kid from, I wasn't from that. So that was my introduction. Um, but all, yeah, all those people were great. Um, they were, everybody was around hanging out at that time, so it was fun to to watch. The art world was very different then than it is now. It, it was a lot less corporatized and a lot more free, and the value of things wasn't so insane, and it, the the kind of the approach to work was a little bit different. Uh, but it was it was fun for me being a teenager, coming up, you know being able to be around people like Christopher Wool, Katie Nolan, and Larry, Mike Kelly. It was, it was a lot of fun to watch that. And the relationship for me, watching your, your film work, to Mike Kelly's video and his observations of what it means to be an American or living in the suburbs or a kid or having a twisted fantasy, what was your exchange like with him or how did his, <clears throat> did, were you aware of his, his film work growing up? Well, not not in high school. Like those videos that he would make were were never really shown mm -hmm. publicly. Um, but it was later when I met, you know, when I started to, you know, when I would see when I I think before I met him, I would just see works in certain collections of, at people's friends' houses, stuffed an, some of the stuffed animals and um, and the paintings and and then pretty early on, I started I my first. Sh kind of art shows or at the Patrick Painter Gallery when I was pretty relatively young, early 20s. And that was, that's how I, pr I met Mike and Paul McCarthy was doing, the, was doing those shows. Ones. And that was in a, uh, Mike? Patrick. Patrick? Patrick was this yeah. incredible, iconic art dealer. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a, he was a wild. Huge personality. Yeah, and he, was, he was a wild guy and he, he showed a lot of really interesting artists and did these beautiful editions. Um, and, uh, but that was yeah that was in Bergamont Station in L.A. and then but that's how I started probably started became friends with Mike, mm. and then I would uh, you know speak at his class sometimes and hang out with him when he would come to New York, but he was a like an early he kind of encouraged a lot of the more the juvenile aspects of elements of the work. Patrick or, or Mike? Mike, yeah. In which way 
he want, yeah, wanted you to act out. Yeah, because out. he was a lot about the id and the kind of a, a, a specific type of American vernacular. And so there were things that we, in, in the films I was making and stuff that I think, I guess, he, he was encouraging. And your paint, the paintings that you're working on today, they don't express necessarily a lot of id, maybe you could mm -hmm. say. It, do you, but they have a continuity mm -hmm. with your film work. Being yeah. Bodily, they're very optical. You'll see them on this. Right. This is a loop of images from throughout Harmony's career yeah, life. I mean, um, well, how do you approach this form of abstraction? For instance? Well, the paintings that are, were, are, are meant, it's like I was saying, well, all the artwork and the way I've always viewed things is a, in, it's all. It's part of one vision. It's a kind of unified aesthetic that the f that there is no real. Uh, I don't really differentiate um, between the films or the the paintings, the writing. I've always just saw it as coming from the same place. Uh, the film, the the paintings or the abstract ones or the abstractions, the semi-abstract ones are 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 more supposed to be meant like it's a it's a feeling. It's more of like they're I call more like a trance or a, I call them loop paintings a lot. Or uh, because, like the films, I I'm interested in. I've always loved a kind of physical response, or making things that were tactile, or made things that were more like a, a drug experience, something that was beyond a kind of a simple articulation and kind of v veered into something that was more of a feeling, or a vibe, or uh, something that would throw you off balance. Like the the movies are a lot of the movies are made of loops and repetition and uh, there's a kind of lyrical element to it and some of the paintings uh, and th so these are more these are the ones I've been working on now in Miami these are more like Miami uh, uh, inspired so what is your these are different what is the vibe that you take on as your go what is the process like to make the these paintings which ones Either these or the well these are different these are these are di different those are the uh, yeah, again, it's, um, it's something that's a more like a, a hallucinatory a tra a kind of trance thing where the surface is shifting and like the movies, the, the, a lot of it is also about color uh, and a kind of transcendence, uh, and a weird kind of hallucination. Mm. And what are the images that populate the newer paintings? Are those found images? Uh, some of them are like some of them are collaged. These are like the the Florida paintings. Uh, some of these are just watercolors, um, like Last Tango in Paris. Yeah, but in Miami. Yeah, I call there's a kind of tropical noir element uh, to these. Mm. Um, yeah. And so, how did you approach this? Um, I guess I'd say problem of making a retrospective, especially as a filmmaker in among other activities. How did you embark upon um, organizing the show? For the Pompidou? Mm -hmm. It's still being done. It's not for another like six months, so we're still working on it. But basically, it's going to be like a, yeah, it'll be like a, a, sh a truncated version of my career. It'll be the movies, the paintings, the writing, everything. Um, we're editing it down now. So, uh, music, everything, yeah. Is it, is it a, a hard thing to imagine seeing your work in a museum context? Or does that give you, are there any yeah. ideas in particular that you wanted to express? I mean, when you're editing, no, I just you cut what you love the most, right? I just want things to look beautiful, mm -hmm. like to pop and just to like, I f feel immersive and I don't really overthink it. It's more just, I just want it to, to be great. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> That's all we want in life. And so, when you were growing up in Nashville, um, how did you first sort of come to, what was your first interaction with culture at large or visual art? Um, culture, uh, I don't really know, because I, I grew up around like a lot of rednecks, so I'd get in fights all day, and with them they would tr try to, you know, it was rough, so I just wanted to do with the opposite of what they were doing. Mm. Um, and that led me to art and uh, and movies and stuff. But I think skateboarding. I got pretty into skateboarding when I was young, and that was probably a a segue into. It was a creative thing, and it was a way of like disappearing with friends, mm. and looking at the world differently. 
So uh, that probably started it. My dad was encouraged always, took me to the movies and took me to museums when we'd go to New York. And then it was, so it was a, you know, it was a thing. And uh, I, in the notes that you sent me, previewing the Pompidou show, you mentioned your father's films. Oh yeah, they wanted to show some of the documentaries that he. What made. are those? What are those like? <clears throat> My dad made yeah these kind of crazy documentaries in the seventies and uh, just about like when I was young, I, I grew up on a commune and then pretty early on I was living in like a circus, and it was about like the circuses, the traveling carnivals, and you know moonshiners, kids that r rode bulls, uh, weird shit. <laughs> <laughs> When That's kind of how I grew when up. When you watch them, do they remind? Do they? I yeah. Mean, clearly, some of the topics yeah. are something you could make a film about. Yeah. Are they in terms of not having seen them? In terms of yeah. style and approach, are they things yeah. that you really relate to? Yeah, because that's how I grew up around a, a lot of that stuff. There was a kind of wildness to it, that, uh, and a freedom. It was a different time in America. You know, it was when kids, when you can be like 11 years old and just take off for the summer on your own and then just just say like I'm I'll be back in a couple months and your parents would be cool with that. <laughs> you know, you can like live on a rooftop when you're you know, 12 or 13 and it, it's all good. <laughs> well, if the alternative is the circus, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, just to totally switch um, switch directions for a second, being as we're in a fabulous Louis Vuitton store, and you have, are someone who practices fine art, works in cinema clearly, um, but also has done a lot of collaborations with commercial brands, Calvin Klein, Supreme, um, but you bring obviously a very distinctive sensibility to those kinds of projects. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, first of all, do you differentiate a commercial project like that from something you consider, consider your visual art? Like for instance, would you show an ad in your show at the Pompidou. Yeah, I think we are. I think we'll show some of this. I don't differentiate. I also like. I cert, I also. I like advertising too. So I. I. I like. When it's in, when you when there's in, when you can do something interesting. Um, and uh, in some ways it affects the culture. Um, I. I just do everything. I do everything. I like it all. It's all. It's if something comes to me or if it's an idea. And it has merit to it, and I feel like I can contribute to make something beautiful, or I can do something. I do it. It's a regardless of budget levels, or it's for this person, it's for myself, it's for a million people, it's for one person. The only thing I've ever done since I was little is just do things that I feel in my heart is interesting. Mm -hmm. If if I can if I can create something, if I can contribute. Then um, and so that that's kind of what the, the same thing with the advertising. So if they come, if somebody comes and it's a cool idea, and they want to try something, and I feel like it's something I can do, then I'll, I'll go for it. Cool. Well, on that note, we're going to welcome our two other guest speakers to the stage. So once again, please welcome Craig Robbins and Sarah Harrelson. Three people from three very different um, creative professions, positions. Um, I thought a place that we could start where maybe all of us have um, a bit of a background is um, this idea of the role of art in culture and what we're all trying to do with art. Um, um, Harmony is someone who um, comes from what you could say a subcultural background and but has also both said and in his work strove to be very mainstream and brought, bring really interesting critical ideas to the table. Um, maybe Craig and Sarah, in, in no particular order, you could talk a little bit about um, how the relationship between art and fashion or art and culture at large is, is changing, either here in Miami or through your work at the, at the magazine or here in Miami as well. I mean, I would say I'm not sure how much I think it's changing. I think art and fashion have been intertwined, you know, for as long as probably any of us can remember. Um, I, you know, I will say as a magazine editor, I'm constantly looking for people like Harmony. <laughs> and I think he makes it sound so simple, but the mind that can do Spring Breakers and the Rihanna video and these beautiful paintings, 
Um, it's, it's just incredible. And he talks about it with such ease. But we're, you know, as magazines sort of constantly looking for the new and what's next and what's exciting, um, he embodies that so effortlessly. Thank you. <laughs> and you haven't been in the magazine yet, so you still have to. All right, we're doing it. I see a cover coming. <laughs> Um, you know, it was great hearing you speak harmony because what we try to do in a neighborhood, um, aspire to do is something similar, just express ourselves. And in, in my case, it's working with creative people, but whether it's architecture or design or, you know, Buckminster Fuller's Dome or an art installation or graphic design or, or the content that then comes in, working with great uh, cultural organizations, um, collaborators like Carlos and Rosa de la Cruz and watching how brilliantly they express themselves or, or Miso uh, with, with Eduardo and, and, and having a symphony here. It just, it's all this different creative energy and, and watching it all come together, it makes also a sense of place or a neighborhood. And so that's what we're trying to do in the design district. And I think, you know, when you talk about art and fashion collaborations, I mean, you're basically taking, you know, you know a, a brand that you're potentially obsessed with and pairing it with, you know, an artist that you're potentially obsessed with. And, you know, the lines are blurred, but I think that's when some really fantastic creativity happens. And Louis Vuitton is a great example of that. And uh, there's, Harmony, your films are... One of, the, one of the most iconic was called Kids. Youth is a big subject, and youth culture is a big subject. You're now having a second child. Congratulations. <laughs> um, how has your, your relationship to youth, and also we have many children of panelists here, how have your re relationship to youth culture changed over the year or years yeah. or been changed since being here in Miami as well? It hasn't changed. I still feel... It's the same. I feel connected to what when it's good. I feel connected to it. Um, when it when there's energy behind youth culture or, or certain elements of youth culture, I feel connected to it. I feel the time has changed, and that the internet has changed the youth culture and and this idea of like um, of, of crews of people and groups and subsets and and things that were underground and above ground now and it doesn't mean the same as when I was a things culturally are completely different now youth culture it's, it's more it's exploded in a way that it wasn't back then it was more of like a you could you could still be in, inventive in a way and you could still take time to uh, uh, to come up with things and ideas and you could still be separate from the world now it's very much about there's a, a connectivity with computers, social media, and stuff that you don't have. You used to have groups of people, tribes that stood for certain things that now, like, it, kids, it, it just doesn't mean the same thing. You, they're not, they're not, st they don't really represent, like, back then there were groups you could be like a goth kid or a skater or eat or, a, you know, whatever, uh, an emo kid. I don't know, what, whatever you could be, um, a skinhead. And now everybody's everything. Yeah, I think so. I think like culture is a different thing. It, back then, there was a real line of delineation between sellout culture, things that I knew f personally, and p everyone that was around me in New York at that time. There were things you would never do because it was a sellout move or it was a kind of pose or something. And now kids are more free. There's no lines. There's no they want to sell out. Like, it's kind of like, that's the goal. Do you for think a lot that leads them. to more creativity or less? I'm not sure. I'm like watching it because it's happening in, in real time right now. So it's interesting to see like what the, what the effect is, the lasting effect. And I feel like the rate of consumption, the, how quickly people consume what's new and then spit it out and then go on to the next is a little different. There's not the time to let things necessarily resonate and to, you know, thinking about m meaning and, and pathology in the same way. 
but but it's also not a complaint. It's something that's new, that's interesting, that's also happening too. Um, the speed of the speed is also interesting. I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think it's new, and I'm not, and I'm watching it. <laughs> One of the things that is so interesting, and I want to get back to this question for each of our other two panelists, is that you've also worked on both sides of the equation. So, casting someone like Selena Gomez in a film, she's also appropriating you in terms of building a certain cultural, yeah. critical portfolio, and in your discussions with artists, actors, professionals, how aware are they, how much are they thinking about that in the decisions and in their approach to the films when they're working with you? Well, I think, well, I think people are aware. Everyone's pretty self-aware now. I think people know. You wouldn't know how, you know, like, you could go to rural pockets of America and the, you could find what was considered a type of outsider culture. Then what happened was when people started getting satellite dishes, in Appalachia, everybody knew how everyone else dressed, and everyone was like, and then the internet, everyone started just, it was this one connected entity, so everybody can, everyone starting to like look the same, I think, you know? There's like a, a gonna be like a unified accent. You talked a little bit about Supreme, mm. um, a brand that you've worked with that started about 18 years ago. And listening to you talk about the change, do you think that a brand like Supreme could be started today? Oh, started today. I don't know, because I was there when they started. Because, they, because those are my friends, and they st started on my street. My first that where I live, my first apartment was right down the street. They're the reason I had to leave New York. <laughs> it's because, <laughs> because all the kids that would hang out there when the store closed would climb up onto my fire escape and just smoke weed and smash on my windows. Um, but it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Yeah, I don't know if it could start right now. I think yeah, created this cult of cool. Yeah, because it took a long time. Because it, I guess it took it took time. And like in the beginning, Supreme was just a, was I remember was like a skateboard shop mostly. So it became this thing that's more of a phenomenon now. But I think that takes time. Yeah, I don't know if it could. I guess there's lots of companies starting now, but I don't know how good they are. Well, well, it's also um, anything that's great that started at one moment can't necessarily start now, like cubism couldn't start now, right. or right. impressionism couldn't That's start a good now. Way. Right. So, right. so I think part of it is just every moment has something that it can give birth yeah. to. Yeah, that's right, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Harmony. <laughs> Craig knows his shit. <laughs> and so, uh, Sarah, how does this idea of youth culture inform the magazine making? Does it influence, is it something you think about? Um, I mean, I don't know that we specifically think about youth culture. I mean, we do think about, um, you know, sort of like an underlying current of, you know, what people are talking about. And, you know, it's interesting you talk about the idea of commercial and non-commercial, um, which is certainly something we think about a lot. Um, and I think Harmony has been able to bounce between very easily, but I don't think everyone can. Um, so, yeah, of course, I mean, we're all informed by youth culture. Um, and it, you know, it's interesting to see what's, you know, what's coming out of it. And as Harmony said, we can all have more access to it than 20 years ago. Yeah, there's no high or low anymore. That's the thing. There's no high culture or low culture. It's uh, cultures exploded it, or things exploded. It's either, at least for me, things are either exciting and there's merit in it and there's beauty in it and there's poetry in it or there's, it's not, or it's an empty gesture. So. In that way, it's it's good because it's up to you to figure out what you like um, and what you're connected to. And Craig, among your many accomplishments, you're also a, a living witness to the changes of in Miami Beach and in Miami and the idea of youth here. How have you seen this city evolved, especially through the history of, say, I mean, this is a sort of a big overly historical question, but through the changes that happened counterculturally here to today, where we are in the design district? Well, the, you know, M Miami Beach was an incredible tourist destination in the 60s, 50s, and 60s. And then in the 70s, it started to decline. By the 80s, Miami had become a different place. And, and the, the Renaissance was really in South Beach, which was a, an example of youth culture. It was a, a very energetic young place 
totally counterculture. I mean, no one believed at that time like you could take those old historical buildings and make something out of it. The, the conventional wisdom was tear it all down. But there was a, like a movement that occurred. Um, it's how I started my business career. Dennis Scholl, who's here also, is one of the handful of developers that, that really started working then. And it, it reset what Miami was about. And I think that what was, was great about South Beach was it wasn't about like the hotel chain, the Hilton or the, the Marriott. It was about the boutique hotel and about creativity. And from that emanated a lot of what, a lot of what we see today. And um, how do you see this new sort of way of seeing the world, either through the internet uh, or just through a different way of, high and, of perceiving high and low? Has that influenced the way that you make your films? I mean, certainly Spring Breakers um, had such a palpable yeah. tension there. Yeah, that was like a pop poem that was meant to... <clears throat> it was like a reflection of that, a lot of it. Um, I think you know the internet is interesting. As it's made it like more difficult to like read. You know, like to read, like reading was a bigger thing, and I find it hard to read. Mm. But um, uh, it's also made video more palatable. Everybody, yeah, everybody takes in the news through um, video, whether they like it or not. Which yeah. Changes the way that we even yeah. relate to no, it. No, I don't know. It'll be interesting also to see how it affects movies and the idea of films and, you know, it'll be, I think things are definitely changing in that way. Mm. I don't, I'm not sure how long, like, conventional movies are going to be there. Mm. As a topic, has the internet become something that you want to write about? Right now. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It's too dark. To write about the internet? I don't even know. What do I, I don't really care. <laughs> um, in terms of your, Sarah, I think we'll open to questions in a second, but Sarah, in terms of the way that the magazines address this idea of, of reaching new communities through the internet, does that change your editorial perspective? I mean, obviously, I'm a proponent of print. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have Instagram. And I sort of just look at it differently. It's sort of, you know, you look at Instagram or the internet as maybe like a daily education or a daily dose of culture, um, a different kind of, you know, way to receive the information. And then the print is obviously the longer form. So I still obviously believe there's room for both. Um, and I do think, you know, Instagram is, can be used as a tool. Harmony, what's on your Instagram? I don't have an Instagram. I don't never. I don't have any social media. Oh, if he had an Instagram, it would <laughs> exactly. Be, just from the text I, messages that I got, I'd be banned like right away. You know, I like the messed up stuff. So, <laughs> so you're not prowling other people. I just go for the whatever's the most disturbing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I just. Uh, I feel like if I started getting into it, it would be hard for me to stop. Yeah. Stop. It's like a. I have too much, many distractions. Fair so enough. I have a lot of f fake Instagrams. Thank you very much. Thank you once yeah. again, Harmony. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Craig. That's great.